ready to start. Let me just turn on the mic. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's nice to see you all in such a big number. I hope you had a nice, fun, refreshing winter break and that you are ready to start this semester. Um, I'm going to start with introducing myself before we delve into a little bit of what NLP is and logistics of this course. Uh, my name is Anna Marasovic. I use she, her pronouns. I have been a professor here at University of Utah since 2022, so I'm pretty new here. And my research is in NLP, large language models. I focus on explainability and other aspects of responsible AI. I dwell a little bit into multimodality. So um, I know the stuff we are going to uh, you know, talk about in this uh, course, which was not always the case when I was uh, teaching. Uh, before I joined Utah, I was uh, in um, Seattle. I uh, worked at the Allen Institute for AI, which is a nonprofit organization founded by late Paul Allen, who had uh, co-founded Microsoft. Uh, and before that, I did my PhD in computational linguistics and other degrees in math. And jumping around department speaks a little bit for how interdisciplinary natural language processing is, which you are going to hear a little bit more uh, in uh, in the uh, today's uh, lecture. Um, I do not think these slides are a little bit cropped here. Huh? Uh, let's try to change that. Although I have no idea how to do that. Let me see. Okay, I don't want to fiddle with the um, trying to understand why the slides are cropped on one of these screens. So I'm just going to uh, not put them in a full screen mode, but I do want to increase them a little bit. That's too much. If anyone knows how to fix the cropping problem, that's... Okay, will this work? It looks a little bit ugly, but we'll survive. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, we have also two teaching assistants in this course, Rishan and Purbid. I don't know whether they are here. If you are, can you raise your hand? Uh, not yet. They will usually be uh, be here. So Rishan is a second year master's student. He served as a TA for NLP last year. Uh, so he has also very extensive knowledge of uh, NLP. I should warn you that NLP was taught by another instructor last year and that I started to design this course from scratch. So things are gonna be different if you, I don't know, have any expectations of the course you have seen maybe uh, previously. Uh, and Rishant has worked on generating models reasoning uh, in plain English with a technique you might have heard of because it's very hot these days, uh, reinforcement learning for from human feedback. Um, and Porbit is a first year master student and he's currently working on making a code base that supports research on finding which data um, has been influential for models uh, predictions. We have a class website and I wanna I don't want to start with logistics immediately but I do want to point it uh, to you here you're gonna find the schedule and you're going to find uh slides that I am presenting as well as the readings uh, and recording of the lecture later on uh, I know some of you like to download slides and then mark them uh, on your iPads um, you can find those the slides from today uh, as well um I will try to upload them before the lecture. It might happen that sometimes I do not. All right, so let's talk about uh, NLP now. Um, NLP technology has become integral part of uh, most people's daily lives, including yours. You most likely have used some kind of NLP technology, like spam filter is probably some kind of machine learning model that takes uh, as an input spam, uh, which is an email of words. Um, you have used machine translation when you travel, you have used chat GPT these days. So this kind of technology is all, all around us. Um, However, NLP comes in different flavors, and you might have heard of these other fields such as computational linguistics, machine learning, deep learning, and you might wonder how they differ. Like, what's the, what's the difference between a machine learning uh, and natural language processing? So, NLP, I will, I will answer this question in a little bit a roundabout way, and I'll talk first, what are the um, fundamental and related questions asked in the NLP community. First question is, in what ways can computers understand 
and use natural language. And we approach this question by uh, implementing and designing computer programs that show language understanding and language use behavior, such as machine translation that is behaving in a way, we design it to behave in a way that professional machine, uh, excuse me, professional translator does. And this is largely an engineering pursuit that depends heavily also on advances in hardware. You might have heard that once graphical units have become useful for deep learning, that's when the revolution in deep learning and these applications of deep learning such as NLP had, uh, had um, appeared. Um, and when we build computer programs that show language understanding and language use today, Today, we are going to use end-to-end uh, -end deep learning techniques. Deep learning is a subfield uh, of machine le learning. And machine learning is a field, uh, algorithmic field, that is designed uh, to uh, de design algorithms that take data and then uh, learn how to make uh, predictions from that data and help us make uh, decisions. Another question that's different from the first one is to what extent can the properties of natural language be simulated computationally? And this is where the field of NLP is intersecting with the fields of linguistics, psychology, and uh, cognitive science. Unlike in the first question, when we ask this question, the language is the object of study. Uh, and computational methods only support our pursuit in understanding language. You might not know it because many of us don't have linguistics as a formal training, but uh, how language is structured is actually uh, unsolved mystery. Like we as a humanity society, we do not know exactly how language is structured and we are still pursuing that understanding. So when we approach this question, we approach it from scientific lens. We exper wanna experimentally advance the construction of theories about language where language is an observable phenomenon. It's the thing we are studying. And uh, there are different ways you can go about this, but traditionally it has also been approached from mathematical lens by uh, looking at the um, formal proofs uh, for these uh, theories. Um, you might have heard the name of Chomsky and you might have heard it even in your um, theoretical computer science classes. And that's why, uh, that's because these fields of uh, linguistics and theoretical computer science actually intersect uh, uh, a lot. Uh, if you want to hear more about this and see more proper arguments for, uh, uh, for how you could go about uh, designing these uh, formal proofs for uh, answering this question, I, check, I recommend that you check Ryan Cotterell's uh, slides where you have a very nice uh, examples. So the point here is that the computational methods play only supporting role. You might use a computational method like a large language model to understand something about human language and to define a theory about a human language, but it plays only supporting role. Whereas in the first question, the way the, you um, design your computational method, that's the point. That's the main uh, ingredient of uh, addressing the first question. So what is uh, NLP um, exactly? Um, many people will use this definition that NLP is the set of methods for making human language accessible to computers. And to me, that, that definition is most centered around the first question of how we can build computational methods for language understanding uh, and language use. Um, so what, how does linguistics play uh, the role here? Historically, linguistic play a role by uh, taking these linguistic insights that we get from the second question and uh, designing our computational approaches around our knowledge of uh, language and how it's structured. And um, it might surprise you then, then or maybe not, <laughs> knowing now this, that the main organization for NLP research is called Association for Computational Linguistics. So computational linguistics is right there and linguistics as, uh, as well. Our flagship conference is ACL and it's North American and European chapters, NACL and EACL. So um, computational linguistics is really the core part of the NLP community, but things have changed for sure in the last 10 years with deep learning. And I, today I wanna to kind of talk about machine learning versus deep learning and how 
linguistics still plays a role and why you will learn it in this course um, and why you should learn it. Not, it's not just because we have been teaching it for a long time and now we are doing due diligence, although to some extent there is a little bit of that as well. Okay, so uh, I really don't like that we can't put it in the full screen. All right, yeah, let me see. Okay, so um, this is a little illustration of how um, NLP intersects with all these other fields. We have a, a we have a huge umbrella field of uh, artificial intelligence AI that has been um, introduced in the fifties with the goal of reducing uh, human-like uh, intelligence uh, in a machine. And uh, within AI, you have a field of machine learning, which is an algorithmic field of uh, addressing some of these questions that relate to AIs. You might have a rule-based system, uh, which doesn't uh, give you a solution with the data automatically, it's a rule. And that's a part of this AI, but not ML. And in the late eighties, this is how um, NLP has been approached uh, as well, largely with these rule-based systems. Within machine learning, we have uh, deep learning, which is, um, this is again, algorithmic field of uh, that's based on a neural network. So you to take one specific family of machine learning models, and then you build everything around it. And then NLP can intersect with each one of these. You can have NLP that's um, using only rule-based systems. You can have NLP uh, that has machine learning techniques, but not necessarily deep learning. Maybe you have um, a linear model that takes manual features. And then you have NLP that intersects with deep learning, with neural networks, and that's largely what we do today. But let, let's go over a little bit of more history. So in the 90s was the first time when people started to work on statistical approaches to NLP. Uh, so my IBM worked on their machine translation. And then uh, also in the 90s, we had first corpus with the syntactic information where human annotators took text and they had annotated, this is a verb, this is a noun, and so on. And that enabled them to build computational approaches because now you had this syntactic information. So people have built stuff like part of speech daggers, tools that can automatically predict which word in your input is a verb, noun, adjective, and so on. Uh, they have built parsers, uh, which gives you a tree, uh, a parse tree over your text. And then in the mid 2000s, we started to do more machine learning that you have maybe heard of such as SVMs, conditional random fields. People have started to look into applications such as named entity recognition, where given text, you want to label which words are uh, corresponding to organizations, to people and so on. And there was a little bit of unsupervised machine learning as well, such as topic mo uh, modeling, grammar induction. And then we move in 2010s into structure prediction, where you are trying to predict all of these uh, structures from text and build your whole pipeline uh, based on this now more rich annotation of text. And then in 2015, things have changed significantly. Um, now, instead of designing features manually saying, okay, uh, this is a subject or, or object in a in a, in a, in this text, and I believe this will be helpful for you to build the uh, parser uh, that will I then use to make a prediction of whether this text is uh, exhibiting positive or negative sentiment. People have started to turn everything into this end-to-end -end pipeline where you, for every word, you have a vector, which we called embedding. And then you put that embedding into a model neural network, which is just a sequence of matrix multiplication plus some application on nonlinear functions on the values of these matrices, all the way to predicting the value and then using gradient descent or other types of optimization to change the values of these matrices to find your solutions. So we took out uh, as much human engineering as we possibly uh, could. And then you don't see it in the, because the lights are funky, but, in, 2015, uh, in 2018, uh, we also had started to pre-train models on extremely large uh, corpora, and we have started to fine-tune models, meaning training them from these 
newly found uh, values in these matrices I mentioned, rather than randomly initialized one, which helped uh, build more general purpose systems, uh, systems that know more, more about a language and therefore you can quickly develop more applications over them, yeah. Uh, when you said sentiment classifiers and cleanly, is that like sentiment analysis or is that something that came before? Uh, so yeah, sentiment classifiers just means you have text and you want to predict certain sentiment labels. Usually we turn it into binary classification, positive or uh, or negative. And uh, this paper by Peng and Lee has been really seminal paper that have shown that yeah, let's let's use sentiment, uh, let's use machine learning uh, for these kinds of textual applications. He had recently uh, won the. Um, test of time award, I don't know the exact term, uh, in one of these uh, ACL conferences as well. So it's a, it's an important piece of work. Okay. Yeah, and sometimes people will use sentiment analysis to refer to something broader than just uh, classification. Okay. You might be interested in what exactly is the sentiment targeted to and by who and so on. Um, okay, so lately, uh, now that ChatGPT exists, uh, that's still, part of NLP community. And we are doing things like prompting. We are not necessarily training models anyway, anymore, or we train them such that they can follow our instructions, or we train them such that they learn which kind of text a person would um, prefer. And therefore we train them to produce text that the person would more likely prefer over something uh, else, which is learning from human feedback. And if you use reinforcement learning, which is again, a set of uh, uh, algorithmic techniques, then you get RLHF that you might uh, have heard of in some, in some way or another. Okay, so what we are going to do in the first part of this course is that we are going to focus on this intersection between deep learning and NLP. Um, and we are gonna focus on the question of how to build programs that can uh, show language understanding and language use behavior. As I said, this is more an engineering pursuit rather than uh, the part of NLP that intersects with cognitive science, psychology, and linguistics. And I wanna emphasize that this part is more oriented when you want to build applications that are designed for well-served languages, Eng English specifically, and then 100 other. But we have many, many more languages which I'll talk about in a few slides. Uh, when we get to the part of, you know, instruction fine-tuning, RLHF, now we are in a more cutting-edge ter territory, and this is something that's more relevant if you are looking at uh, understanding what large language models of today are, and if you are interested in the uh, research aspect of NLP. If you want to build an application, you don't necessarily need RLHF and instruction fine-tuning. So before our spring break, we are going to get into this more cutting-edge stuff. Um, for me, the goal is to understand, how, for you to understand how machine learning and deep learning methods are used in NLP. So we'll go over the necessary basics, we'll go over all of them, but the pace will be quicker than in your machine learning and deep learning classes. Uh, and the two, the first two assignments you'll do will require you to implement a logistic regression classifier, a neural classifier, you will need to implement a transformer language model, and you will need to fine tune a pre-trained transformer model. And I should change this from two to the first three because I changed this yesterday. Um, so I wanna uh, give a little bit of warning here, and I do not mean to discourage anyone to take this course. Uh, the formal prerequisites are not deep learning and machine learning. And as I said, I will go over these uh, things you need to succeed in this course. Um, however, I'm going to be honest with saying that those who have taken these courses will follow along quicker and they will probably solve the assignments faster. Again, that doesn't mean that if you have taken this, not taken these courses, you will not succeed in this class. It just means that you will need to start working on your assignments as soon as they are released. Uh, you will need to proactive, be proactive about seeking clarifications in Piazza, office hours, to me whenever you need me. And you will maybe need to be ready to read some extra material. So uh, it's, um, I try, I will try to go over all the bases, but it's also hard to know um, at this point for me, 
whether I have gone over something that you have heard for the first time way too quick. So something might be, um, it might be necessary for you to read a little bit in a slower, slower pace. Um, if you are, uh, if you didn't take uh, these courses, I strongly encourage you to check the first homework assignment, which is released today. It is uh, due on the 25th of January. Uh, and check how hard it is for you to solve that assignment. Uh, and go to this lecture, this first few lectures. And uh, next Wednesday, we are going to talk about machine learning basics. If that all of that is extremely overwhelming, I think that would be, uh, for me, a sign for concern. And I would recommend that you drop the class and take maybe machine learning, uh, which is happening in the same semester. Again, I am not trying to convince anyone to drop this course, but I do want to give you this, uh, this heads up. Um, if you have taken these courses, that means that for you, things will going to be a little bit boring probably in the beginning, like the first month, uh, you'll be like, I have heard about this. Uh, so bear with me, we'll get to the material uh, that is new and that you probably didn't hear in your uh, core machine learning and deep learning courses. Any questions about this? Yep. So um, I'm one of those people who hasn't taken uh, I have taken computer vision, though, which was a graduate level course and had to do, you know, with deep learning and mm -hmm. machine learning type stuff. So would you say that maybe I do? Yeah, I didn't check the computer vision course, uh, you know, what exactly are you being taught there, but I expect then you'll be fine because computer vision is in a sense similar to teaching NLP because computer vision is also based on machine learning, deep learning, and once upon a time it was not, and then it, like instructors need to figure out how to teach for all the students. Mm -hmm. So I expect then you, you'll be fine. I think... Um, if you have never heard about train test split and stuff like that, um, that's going to be new. Uh, and then for me is like, okay, uh, this is something that's basics of the basics. So I will mention it, but I won't spend uh, lots of time on uh, making you understand uh, what those things are. So I think it's really subjective. So come to the lectures, check the assignment and judge for yourself. I think that's the best thing you can do for yourself if you are un unsure. Um, in the first, uh, in this first couple of weeks, we are going to go over these machine learning uh, and um, deep learning uh, basics uh, across um, an example of sentiment classification, which will also be covered in your uh, assignments. And this is going to be just to show you uh, one very basic NLP system for classification. Uh, what kind of elements of that system you need and what do you need to do with this text to actually make a prediction uh, with, a, with a, a machine learning system. And then we're going to move to kind of go over, or going over the journey to the modern large language models. And we are going to start with engram and neural language modeling, which has been a historically long task in uh, NLP community, but it is the basis of what we call today generative AI. When we do generative AI, we just predict the next word, basically what language modeling is. And a lot of um, core uh, modeling aspects of today's large language models uh, are built from um, what has been used to advance machine translation. So for example, transformer is a common neural uh, network architecture that we are going to use for everything uh, in NLP uh, and the before and the the main component of the transformer is something called self attention and that self attention had merged from attention mechanism that had emerged specifically for machine translation. So we'll go over the history of machine translation and all of that together will bring us to the uh, current uh, large language models, uh, which should be probably exciting for, for you all. Um, so I talked a lot about these end-to-end systems before, um, and still today, uh, there is something we will call standard NLP pipeline, which means you take a text, you split it into uh, some units. The most basic unit is a word, but we go, uh, we'll do subword level. Uh, so, uh, and then we're gonna, we talk about tokens rather than words. But for today, for simplicity, let's just say we are splitting the text into uh, words. 
then we might mark, okay, these, this is a noun, this is an adjective, this is a word. So that's part of speech uh, tagging. Then we are going to parse this uh, text. We are going to say, aha, uh -huh, there is this adjective and this noun together, they form a noun phrase. So they are uh, syntactically connected. And we might apply name identity recognition. As I said, we want to label, oh, this is an organization, uh, this is a person, uh, and so on. Um, and when you have this very rich structure, then you go about making a prediction. For example, whether the text is positive uh, or negative. And some of you might be wondering, why do we need that if we are doing these end-to-end -end systems? Here I'm referring to this work uh, that had shown that uh, BERT, which is one of these language models, um, I don't dare to call it large anymore, <laughs> given that larger exists. Uh, so it's a pre-trained language model that had uh, been released in 2018 and kind of started this pre-training revolution. And um, these uh, researchers have found that Although BERT has not been trained on these uh, structures, such as named entity recognition outputs or uh, syntactic parsers, if you give this kind of a model large volume of text without explicitly uh, uh, being told to do so, it will implicitly learn to um, capture these kinds of structures. So if you take a vector that represents your text from some of these layers of this neural network architecture, and you check whether you can predict, let's say, whether this is a noun or verb from that representation, you will be able to do that without ever training these models to, to do that. So the point here is that in this, this paper has shown that in a way, BERT has rediscovered this classical NLP pipeline and then again, you might wonder, well, if my model is uh, doing this on its own, why would I need to learn how to do it and give it to the, uh, to the model? And I think there are several reasons for why we still need to learn linguistic structure. I will present some of them, uh, but there are, of course, many more. Um, so you, today, and I will come to that as well, NLP is part of these larger discussions about uh, AI and what does it mean to understand and what does it mean to reason and whether these models are truly reasoning and understanding language. Um, so going a few steps back, structural properties of languages allow natural language speakers like us to make infinite use of finite means, which means we have finite words but we still can make infinite way of expressing our thoughts with language. And when we talk about learning a language, to a large extent, what we mean is learning how surface form, meaning words, relate to underlying structures, such as a parse tree, a syntactic parse tree of a text. And when people and machines do this explicitly, when we uh, connect surface form to, to uh, underlying structure, we talk about parsing and related processes that I mentioned, part of speech, chunking, uh, part of speech tagging, chunking, name identity recognition, co-reference resolution, and so on. So one of the big questions is, how is this core problem addressed in deep learning systems? and in human sentence processing as well, because we said human language is a mystery as well. Bendera Kohler had in 2020 released this huge paper for our community that has said that attributing an understanding of meaning to a system which has only seen, uh, seen, seen form is a categorical error, meaning we are talking about the two completely different things. And to illustrate that point, they show this octopus test where they say, imagine an octopus that has um, a way to uh, listen to a communication between two people who are stranded on two completely independent uh, islands, but they have a telegraph. Uh, and somehow this octopus can listen to uh, their conversation, but it never sees um, is what anything that they are describing because octopus is going to be in the sea where they are outside and they can see many other behaviors that a creature that's purely in sea could not see. And then they build the argument uh, uh, around that, like how you can kind of follow and pretend you can uh, understand the conversation without um, actually understanding it. 
Now, um, if you want to be part of these discussions, you do need to understand these arguments about, okay, if they say that uh, we need to understand the actual underlying structures, but you never know any kind of structure of language, you will have a very hard time following these conversations. And you might be, um, you know, doing a shortcut and thinking, oh, if my model shows a medical entrance exam, it understands, it reasons, which would be wrong. So if you want to be part of these conversations, you do need to engage with these um, linguistic structures, which are uh, core, uh, be core, core arguments behind uh, these uh, discussions. And these discussions at the, at the center of what we are talking about today uh, in the AI community. I also want to make a little digression and I talk about, which is kind of a digression, um, about what is AI. Um, I love this blog post by Michael I. Jordan. I recommend it highly uh, to read it. It's from 2018, still very, very relevant. It talks about how we refer to everything as AI and what are the issues of that. So to be clear, the phrase AI was coined in the 90, in late 1950s to refer to had the aspiration of realizing in software and hardware, uh, an entity possessing human uh, level intelligence. And it was meant to focus on high level or cognitive capability for humans to reason and to learn. However, in the last several decades, AI had become, we use it when we want to refer to machine learning, which is, as I said, an alg specific algorithmic field that aims to produce uh, algorithms that process data, make predictions, and make us make decisions better. And then uh, when Amazon became a thing, when they started their own, uh, you know, heady trajectory, um, they combined these ML experts with a database and uh, distributed systems experts, something we today refer to as data science. And then we started to refer to everything as AI. Amazon's business model is AI. This had the aspiration to uh, define, uh, to produce uh, human-like uh, intelligence was AI. Everything became uh, AI. So this confluence of ideas and the technology trends was what we branded as AI. And I love uh, Michael's uh, a snippet here where he says, one could simply agree to refer to all of this uh, as AI. And indeed, that's what appears to have happened. Such labeling may come as a surprise to optimizations or statistics researchers who wake up to find themselves suddenly referring to as AI uh, researchers. So this is a little digression of what we call as AI, but in a way it's related to what I was saying before, because if we want to have human-like uh, intelligence that possesses our level of reasoning and learning, uh, then the capacity to understand language is one of the central features of our of our human intelligence not every intelligence but human intelligence and reasoning is also essential for basic tasks of language processing so in a way to to build an actual ai you need to build a uh, nlp technology that uh, has abilities to reason uh, and learn like uh, like a human and then how do you know whether your ai is reasoning uh, you need to go back to these questions that go beyond pure uh, machine uh, learning, as I have mentioned in the previous slide. Okay, um, moving on to why else. Um, very common strategy today is to build these pre-trained language models, and we take data corpora from 100, uh, 100 languages. And we train a model on all this data, and then we have what we call a multilingual pre-trained model that should be able to then make predictions for any language, any of six over 6,000 languages. It doesn't work like that. These other languages, and not even mentioning so many other dialects, are usually left, uh, left behind. So if you want to work on those languages, you do need to know more than just pure deep learning and machine learning. Um, unfortunately, this is probably a little bit slow because of this funky uh, setup we have here. Uh, but on the leftmost table, you have, um, in, a, in the first column, you have different languages. And in, in the second column, you have a number of papers in our NLP community per million uh, of uh, speakers. And what you see that in the upper part, some languages are really uh, well-served relative to the number of speakers. 
And then uh, in the lower part, you have languages with many millions of speakers. For example, uh, here we have from 30 to uh, 85 million that have one research paper produced for them. So we would call these languages as languages that are not well served by our community or under-resourced languages. The term resource is a little bit funky because if you have 85 million speakers of a language, it probably has lots of like some kinds of resources. It's just not the resources of that are used for uh, research and uh, NLP development. And just to illustrate to uh, how, how bad the situation for these languages can then be, in this paper from last year, so not a very old paper, from last year, uh, these researchers have produced a data set for language identification, meaning I give you text and you tell me which language is written in, which is super important for all applications on the web, right? Um, so it's a very basic task, just identifying the language the text is written in. And they did produce a data set where they have heavy representation in uh, sub-Saharan uh, languages and uh, others that are typically not represented. And then they had uh, evaluated uh, systems. Some of them are really new from 2022 uh, to identify whether what's the language in these texts. And the F1 score was at most 18%. This should be 100. So this is extremely, extremely low. So. For these languages that are not those 100 languages, you really need something else uh, than just pre-training a language model. And I really mean it. Uh, for 80% of languages, there is no corpus for NLP modeling since uh, by study in 2020. So not in, I suspect in the three years, this hasn't been largely improved. So for 80% of languages, you don't stand a chance to pre-train a language model because you literally have no data to pre-train a language on. And this has consequences in our daily lives as well. So three in four users of the internet are unable to understand more than 60% of all websites, at least without a translation tool. But if you don't have a translation tool, then you don't have a chance to even understand any of those uh, contents. So still, we need more than just those deep learning approaches that heavily depend on the availability of the data. And the last argument I want to present is this new trend that has been emerging in our community called citational amnesia in NLP. Uh, in this paper in the last year, these researchers had uh, did uh, they did they did an analysis of uh, over seventy thousand papers published in between nineties uh, and twenty twenty one, and they have found that uh, sixty two percent of cited papers from the from the prior five years only, and only seventeen percent are ten uh, percent years old. Um, before 2014, and remember that's when the deep learning revolution had started, the median age and the diversity of citations was steadily increasing. So people were better at citing older works, acknowledging and attributing where original ideas have actually come from. And then in 2014, things have changed because the field become, became ultra speed. Everything is happening in, in a really, really, really fast pace. We are publishing really fast. Uh, the papers become outdated really fast. Um, new models are released every week. Everything is happening uh, at a, a very, uh, very, very high pace. So current NLP uh, papers have all time low temporal citational uh, diversities. Um, and if you look at the most cited papers, unlike in the 90s, uh, today they are also cite really uh, with low uh, diversity. Um, and I think this is important to know because, um, and I wanna bring back a, again, example of language modeling. Language modeling is this very old task that we have been um, teaching and teaching and teaching. And all of a sudden it became the core of AI. So something that seemed, okay, it's not super relevant today, might be become extremely re relevant later on. Um, and I do think we need to be, you know, citing properly 
and attributing the uh, or where the original ideas come from. So I think us as uh, instructors have have a role to play that <laughs> this kind of situation is not uh, really uh, happening. So with all that said, uh, when we come back from our spring break, we are going to spend a couple of weeks going over the linguistic structures. We are going to go look at the syntax. Uh, we are going to look into semantics, uh, stuff like co-reference resolution. Uh, it's going to be a pretty comprehensive look at the uh, linguistic structure. And then again, each one of these uh, structures can again be um, predicted by a deep learning system. It's just a question of whether you then use those outputs, aggregate them to make the final a prediction that you actually care about. Um, okay, before I move into the logistics, uh, I also want to talk a little bit about how NLP is different from other uh, ML applications, uh, but maybe we can stop here and see whether there are any questions about this um, linguistic structure and the difference between uh, NLP with purely end-to-end -end deep learning uh, systems. All right. I covered some more. Um, okay, so let me just talk a little bit more about the difference between NLP and other uh, uh, applications of ML. So one thing that makes NLP hard is that the textual data is fundamentally discrete, meaning text is represented with symbols, with words. Um, unlike, let's say, in computer vision, where we have images that are represented uh, as matrices of pixels, and pixels have continuous uh, values. What does this mean? Um, for example, you cannot gradually approach a solution because you are not in this continuous optimization space. You, you, you cannot come closer and closer to the thing because the thing, the thing we are talking about is, is discrete. Um, so for when we when we do text generation, for example, we are sampling from a vector where this vector represents distribution over uh, our uh, vocabulary. Um, we can't just use that to uh, to uh, um, reach the optimal solution. Another issue is that when we add a small noise to our input, for example, we might want to test whether our model is robust and we add a small noise and we check whether the prediction change. It should not, right? Because the noise is small. With NLP, that doesn't work so trivially because I can add, uh, my word is represented with some uh, vector. And if I add that small noise, I now shift to another vector, uh, but that vector might not correspond to any word in my vocabulary. So I take the nearest neighbor and my nearest neighbor can be something uh, that completely changes the word, the meaning of my sentence. So for example, if I have birds fly, I take my embedding of the word birds, I add a little bit of noise, I end up somewhere else in my vector space, There, I don't hit any of the other vectors I already had, I take the nearest neighbor and see which word it corresponds to, it might uh, be word dogs, and then I have sentence dogs fly, which makes uh, no sense and is completely different from my uh, original sentence. So finding these uh, um, optimization procedures and doing robustness analysis is harder for NLP, uh, this, uh, NLP applications. Um, another issue, uh, not an issue, but something else to have in mind is that the distribution over words resembles that of a power law, which means that there will be a few words that are very frequent and a long tail of words that are not. Um, Another thing is that language is uh, compositional. So you can combine um, units of language, whatever that is, let's say a phrase to build another, another sentence. So these two things together means that NLP models must be robust to observations that not occur in the training data. And this is a bit a stronger notion of generalization than the standard gener notion of generalization in machine learning, where your model needs to generalize to new instances of the distribution you have seen during uh, training. Here, you might have never seen a word or a, uh, or a sentence 
but you still need to be able to understand the meaning of the of this uh, whole sentence like a human. And finally, language is very ambiguous. That's why human languages and nature languages uh, processing is different than programming languages. Um, we have we we have words that we use differently. The same word in a, we use them differently, and now this word has a completely uh, different meaning. Um, when we do text generation, there isn't just a single way to generate something. For example, if we want to generate a summary given a document, there are multiple ways. There is an ambiguity in what is the best summary. Uh, unlike in other applications of machine learning, where you have ground truth and uh, input is never ambiguous. Uh, you see exactly what you see. Any questions about this? Okay, so with all of that, uh, that gives you just a little bit of glimpse of kinds of things we are going to talk about uh, in this uh, in this course. Uh, reminder, we are gonna start with those machine learning, deep learning basics, work out uh, to large language models. So you can expect that next. Um, and I want to reuse the reminder of the class time to talk a little bit about logistics of the course. So uh, first of all, you should all read the syllabus carefully. You are all responsible for understanding everything that's there. I probably will miss saying something that's in syllabus, but if it's written there, it still uh, holds. So please, after the class, read the syllabus carefully. Uh, if you have read it before, I did introduce a few changes yesterday. So um, maybe read it uh, again. The main change is that we are going to have uh, four assignments and therefore the evaluation has changed a little bit, which I will mention uh, here as well. Um, we are going to do all of our communication uh, in Piazza. So please, if you haven't already, join uh, Piazza. Uh, if you have any general questions about the content or policy or assignments that might concern all of the students in class, please make a public post. If you have something that concerns you or a group of people you work with, then you can uh, make a private post and please share it with both the TAs and me. If you um, share it with TAs, the chance of getting a response faster um, is more uh, likely. Uh, any kinds of regrade requests should be done within one week from getting the grade. And uh, you should, uh, because we are going to submit everything through Gradescope, you are also going to submit your request for regrading in uh, grade, uh, Gradescope. Uh, if you have any urgent accommodations, anything that's uh, really personal, then reach out to me uh, via email. Do mention the CS. 6340 uh, in the subject, because then I can easily notice your email in my huge flow uh, of emails. Uh, this is the also reason why we turn put everything in Piazza. We have a system. PAs are going to uh, check Piazza daily. And uh, because it helps me separate questions from the class from all the other questions I get in my email. So it's way easier system for me if we all communicate on Piazza. Um, I will, when I check uh, Piazza, I will endorse messages from TAs. That means that I have nothing else to add, that's fine. Um, and I personally won't check anything after 5 p.m. Uh, I won't work on the weekends or holidays. I also encourage the uh, TAs to, to do the same. So have that in mind that if you need something over the weekends or holidays that likely you will not get an answer. Um, you can post anonymously to other students in class, but not to me or the TAs. So also have that in mind that we always know who the uh, author of a post uh, is. Feel free to answer questions from other students, uh, but if we, the questions are about the assignments, don't uh, share your solutions. Those posts will be immediately made private. Uh, announcements about scheduling, releasing grades, logistics will be done through the Canvas announcement. So uh, if you have not set your notification such that you get uh, notified when we share announcements, please uh, do so. Uh, any questions about the communication part? All righty. 
Uh, we have plentiful of office hours. Basically, every day there are some kinds of uh, office hours, except the ones that are with me in my office. All others will be in uh, 3105 in Maryland Engineering. Um, so please make use of office hours. They are there for you. Uh, if you have questions, come. We are happy to uh, help you out. Um, that said, um, with regarding Python, uh, sorry, I meant to share this point by point, but because this slide setup is funky, it's now part of this block of text. Uh, regarding Python, um, I expect that you know how to program in Python. So that's uh, expected that you know. And when you come to the office hours, uh, we will not be reviewing your code directly. So if you don't know how to code a list in Python or how to make a dictionary, that's something we expect you to know. And we will help you with turning ideas into pseudo code, but we'll not tell you, and this is how you uh, code a, a list in Python. These are kinds of questions are not something we will uh, be able to uh, help, help you uh, with. It sounds a little bit harsh, but it is because otherwise office hours um, are used to help uh, just a few students and uh, it becomes a massive issue for uh, everyone. Also, you will need to know how to code in Python to solve the assignments because they're not the basic level of uh, coding in Python. Uh, so if you do not know how to code in Python, um, check the first assignment immediately. Uh, it might happen that you have coded in other languages like C Sharp and you had coded in Python just a little bit. I think that should probably be fine. Like with a little bit of Google search, you'll probably figure it out. Um, but if you have very uh, small experience with coding whatsoever, that I suspect might be an issue. So check the first assignment uh, immediately. You are the best judge of whether that's going to be too hard or not uh, for you. Um, questions about Python? Yes, please. Uh, yes, but very specific libraries because we're going to have auto graders. And then if you use more than that, things are going to crash. And that's specified in the assignment as well. So the first one, I think you'll use NLTK and Spacey uh, and later on PyTorch. Um, I think that's NumPy. Yeah, I think that's about it. Yeah. Um, all right, so we're going to have four assignments. Uh, first three are going to be programming. The fourth one uh, will likely be uh, just on the paper. Um, the first one is released, as I mentioned, probably 10 times already. Please check it out uh, immediately. Um, I would recommend everyone, regardless of your uh, coding experience, to start early. Like these. Um, uh, assignments are a little bit, um, they, they require more than just like one, I would say a, a few hours before the deadline kind of work. Uh, so start start early. Um, you can check the deadlines, but the first one, you will have three weeks for the first one. And then the next one will get two weeks each. It's not because they are easier. Uh, so also have that in mind. They are probably going to be a little bit even more, uh, slightly maybe more, uh, intense than the than the first one. Um, yeah, as I said, we are going to use grade scope and uh, auto graders, and your assignments are going to make forty percent of your final grade. Uh, we'll have a final project, and final project will uh, count for thirty percent of your grade, and we'll have midterm and final exams that are going to be in person. Please check the dates now and make sure you can come in person because you're required to come in person. Uh, so please, if you have already have some kind of conflicts like with another course, uh, the exam is at the same time, I would love to hear that immediately such that we can arrange what needs to be arranged. Uh, if you're traveling for personal reasons, that's not a sufficient reason to not come to uh, exam. So conflicts with other exams, and uh, hopefully you won't have any kind of medical emergencies. If you do have, then we'll require documentation. Uh, so please check these uh, check these dates. Questions about the evaluation? Yeah. What does the final project entail? Is that an individual or group project? Yeah, so I think I have that on the next slide. Uh, I will talk about late submissions in a second. Um, 
in terms of the final project, I um, have a different criteria for the undergrad section of this course and for the grad sections. So if you're an undergrad, then you have two options. I will give you um, uh, code and instructions for looking into a, a something called data artifacts. Data artifacts are these shortcuts that the human annotators introduce in the uh, our training data that models can then use uh, to make predictions in a way that's not the way we wish to um, model to solve the problem. For example, in sentiment classification, if you leave numerical scores, such as seven out of 10 at the end of the review, the model will just look at those uh, numerical scores, ignore the entire text of the review and make uh, be able to predict that positive uh, sentiment review. And that would be a data shortcut. And it's going to be not like other assignments, we're going to require more creativity, but uh, it is um, more solid like direction you get if you're an undergrad. And option two is original research that you can do, you can pick a project of your choosing uh, and do an investigation if that's what you prefer. Uh, grad section will also have an uh, option uh, to uh, do original research, but your option won't be to be able to uh, look into these data artifacts with the code uh, given. Rather, you are going to be able to reproduce the published paper. There is this very nice reproducibility challenge that happens every year. If you win it, you get a ton of Google Cloud credits, which is uh, great if you want to continue working on uh, uh, you know, GPU-intensive experiments. Uh, the, our field has a little bit of reproducibility crisis. Um, you know, we say we're going to release the code, then we don't release the code, or we release it, but um, it's a mess, and there are bugs and whatnot, and the choices of hyperparameters we have selected may, might be uh, affecting results in a way that we didn't intend. So uh, you can take a paper and you can try to reproduce it. And through this process, you're going to learn so, so much extra about what's not actually reported in the, in the paper. So um, yeah, I really enjoy seeing these kind of reproducibility uh, challenges. Uh, so yeah, I hope some of you decide to do some of that. Uh, and at some point I will share more instructions and I'll um, I'll give you an examples of successful projects uh, that have, we have seen before. Um, yeah, I envision that you're going to start to work on your projects after the spring break though, because you will be very busy with your assignments before the um, before the uh, spring break. And there is, I think you just need to learn a few things before you can do the project. Uh, and then uh, the, the final assignment, as I mentioned, won't be programming. So you can work on it while you're actually working on your uh, project as well uh, throughout the second part of the semester. Uh, and in terms of deliverables, you'll just need to deliver the final report. There won't be uh, presentations or proposals. Okay, questions about that? Yeah. Will you suggesting like published papers we can reproduce or like we can find it on our uh, I recommend that you follow the ML reproducibility challenge, which requires that you publish, uh, take one of these published works in one of our top conferences. I think it has more value if you find something new about the published paper in top venues, uh, because it has more significance than any other paper. That said, there are some interesting papers that are currently on archive and uh, incentives in publishing in our field, uh, field are very strange right now, like industry labs, they publish or not as they feel. So there might be some good preprints to look at that um, you know you might use, but you will need to run that by me to be sure that it looks good. Yeah. I feel like there was another question maybe there, but. So for undergrad section as the options would want to be like a group assignment, a group project. Yeah, you uh you can do it on your own, or you can be a group of um I didn't decide yet, but I think two typically makes the most sense. Three becomes two um to spread, and it's not clear who did what. Yeah. 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 Um, I think only option two. I I might give you uh, an option for 
for option one, I might give you another option to look into this on a completely original way. And then you might want to work with another person. Yeah. Okay, um, which brings me to uh, back, back to this slide uh, that you should read the syllabus very carefully. Uh, again, um, you are responsible for everything there, but I'm now reminded that I did skip this one. Uh, so just uh, in terms of your late submissions, you can be late up to 48 hours. If you are late 24 hours, up to 24 hours, you get 10% deduction, 24 to 48, 20% deduction. However, you can be uh, late with one assignment. Uh, no questions asked. You don't need to ask permission, and we will still consider your full, uh, you know, full uh, points uh, there. So one assignment. If something happens, you just you are just late. Uh, don't worry about it. But then every other assignment, you uh, get uh, this uh, deduction, and we won't take any assignments that are more than forty-eight hours uh, late. Uh, assignments are going to be posted far ahead of time uh, that I won't be really considering any kind of uh, medical emergencies on the day of the deadline. Um, that said, if you have prolonged illness uh, or any other kind of thing that I can help you with to, to handle this, uh, let me know. Uh, I'm happy to uh, arrange what needs to be. Okay, are there any other questions? If not, I will just quickly go over the syllabus. I didn't think I will have enough time to go over it. Um, we talked about prerequisites. I didn't talk about the materials. You are not required to buy any books or any kinds of other resources for this uh, course. Uh, we'll be following a book by Jacob Eisenstein here, uh, Jacob Eisenstein called Natural Language Processing. It has a free available version that I have linked here. Uh, it's not the latest version, which is paid. We are gonna use this free version. And another useful book is by uh, Jurovsky and Martin, Speech and Language Processing. Um, I'll probably um, share uh, pointers to uh, one or both of these uh, books. There is also a primer on neural network models for nature and language processing you might find useful. And then the classic uh, deep learning book is really, really great uh, where, you know, again, if you find that something has been rushed, uh, you might find lots of information uh, in, the, in this uh, uh, book uh, as well. I'll share all the lecture recordings that will all be on YouTube. Um, and I think, what we should uh, also talk about is uh, the academic honesty. Uh, yeah, watch out for the academic misconduct uh, and you should be checking the academic misconduct of the School of Computing that has a strike system. Uh, if uh, there has been anything um, that violated the academic uh, misconduct, you get the strike one and uh, other people uh, at the college are notified, and then the other strike has very more severe consequences. Um, I do recommend that you talk to each other and that you form studies, and you are welcome to chat about the uh, assignments. Uh, when it comes to writing the actual code, uh, you need to do it on your own. Um, I think the most suspicious situation happened when students have collaborated in actually valid way, but then they also sit together and code it, and then their code turned out to be exactly the same. And then it's hard for the instructor to uh, distinguish between, oh, you just work together and you actually had put effort into this assignment versus you haven't done anything for it. Um, so please chat with each other, learn from each other. When it comes to actually starting to write code, do it on your own, because then the differences will be uh, visible immediately. You're going to call your variables differently, you might implement, you know, for loop differently, just the differences then happen. Uh, but do talk to each other. I always feel like this kind of talk about <laughs> honesty and integrity turn you into being too, um, you know, uh, you don't want to take any risk to be labeled as uh, doing this kind of uh, academic uh, misconduct. But be aware of it because the uh, the processes are quite serious if something uh, does happen. 
Okay, um, any questions? Okay, I think then we're gonna stop here. We are gonna finish a little bit earlier and then start uh, on Wednesday with, with our machine learning basics. Yeah, I'm excited.